Dr. Luke has one goal, and that is to make known the good news of Jesus Christ to all the world, that no one is lost to the kingdom of heaven. Luke's gospel centres on a divine saviour, Jesus, and he's keen to point out that Jesus is the saviour of the world, and further, the saviour of the whole world, and not just a select few. Luke's Gospel is about man and his needs, and in particular, man's need for the saviour of the world. For Luke, there is no kind of person the Gospel is not aimed at, cannot reach, no boundary it can't cross. He is not, however, saying that everyone will be saved, but rather that anyone can be saved, regardless of race, background, gender or age. And we see this belief that the good news of salvation is available for all laid out very carefully here in chapter 15. Last week, Lisa was speaking about how hard hearted the Pharisees and the other teachers of the law were, with Jesus warning them that those who would exalt themselves would find themselves instead humbled. At the start of this chapter, we again hear how the Pharisees and the scribes are grumbling about Jesus' behaviour in meeting and eating with the tax collectors and the sinners. They couldn't understand how Jesus, if he was truly the Messiah and the Son of God, could mix with those that society deemed unsuitable and unworthy. Society, of course, being what the Pharisees decided it was. They couldn't accept that God would be interested in a sinner or someone who did not live to their rules and standards, not recognising, of course, that they, in fact, were sinners themselves. The Pharisees and the scribes uttered those words about Jesus welcoming and eating with the sinners and meant them as a complaint. But, however, they were absolutely correct and had put the gospel of salvation into a nutshell. When sinners draw near to him, yes, Jesus does receive them with open arms and welcomes them home to the kingdom of his father. When the lost or prodigal son turns back away from his own way of life and returns towards home in the frame of mind required by Jesus' teachings on the narrow door, humbly confessing that he's no longer worthy to be called his father's son, then his father opens his arms of love, embraces him and welcomes him back into the fold. But let's go back a bit before we jump ahead too far. This parable of the lost son is actually the third in a trilogy of lost parables that Jesus gives to the Pharisees in response to their grumbling. Firstly, Jesus asks which of them, on losing one of his 100 sheep, would leave the other 99 in a safe spot and go back to search out the missing one. And when the missing sheep was found, would they not rejoice and call in their friends to help celebrate the safe return of the one who had been lost? Jesus tells them that there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous people who need no repentance. Next, Jesus immediately tells them of the woman who lost one of her ten silver coins. She lit a lamp and began to search for the lost coin. She carefully swept every corner and spot in the room until she finally finds it. She's very excited in finding what she thought was lost because it meant so much to her, and so calls her friends and neighbours to celebrate. Jesus tells the Pharisees that God's angels will rejoice and be full of joy over the one sinner who repents. Then Jesus goes on to the third story, the prodigal son, which, along with the Good Samaritan, is probably the most well-known of Jesus' parables. Luke is unique in being the only gospel writer to include this parable. Matthew relates the first story of the lost sheep, but the other parables appear only in Luke's account. And, as we shall discover shortly, there's probably a very good reason for it. 
We've all probably heard many a talk on this parable and it's usually used as an illustration of the love of God for any one of us, his children. For me though, this parable really ought to be read and studied together with those of the lost sheep and the lost coin as they each form a part of a greater whole. The stories themselves run into each other as a continuing narrative. There is the word or between the first two showing clearly that the second follows directly on from the first and then Jesus continues in bringing the third part. So it seems to me that they are to be read and understood as a whole. And here I think is why Luke includes all three of the sections and not just the one as per Matthew. Luke wrote his gospel in order to bring together into one place the teachings and ministry of Jesus. It was about 60 AD, some 27 years after Jesus' death, resurrection and ascension to his father. And there was a danger that these teachings were being lost to the memories of those who had actually been there during Jesus' earthly ministry. The second coming hadn't materialised quite as quickly as people had first thought it would and the word needed to be recorded for the benefit of those then living wherever they were and for those yet to come. One commentator on Luke writes this. The three parables are like three musical instruments which, although each makes a different type of sound, are nevertheless playing the same tune. We hear the distinctive tone qualities in each story as we look at them separately, but as soon as we consider them together we can hear their three melodies are identical. The sheep is lost, then found. The silver coin is lost, then found. The sun is lost, then found. The salvation, which is the fundamental theme of Luke's Gospel, is here summed up in the phrase lost and found. All three parables taken together show us people's misery in being lost and God's joy in finding them. And it is on account of this misery and this joy that the great plan of salvation has been brought about. Jesus makes it clear that he has come to find the sinful wandering people, those who had gone their own way and become lost amongst the detours and the dead ends and the mazes of life. In the first parable, Jesus is the shepherd and we are the lost wandering sheep to whom he has come to seek out and find. In Isaiah 53 verse 6 we read, all we like sheep have gone astray and all have turned their own way. Yes, Jesus searches for lost sinners, just as the shepherd searches for the one lost sheep. And Jesus is making the point to the Pharisees that being with the lost, the sinners and those whose society had shunned was exactly what he had come to do. If the Pharisees had read and understood their Old Testament properly, then they would have seen that Jesus was the shepherd that God spoke about through Isaiah and Ezekiel. The shepherd who would search and seek out his lost sheep and bring them back into the good fold. Turning to the lost silver coin, this was an object of great worth and value, but it was an object and not a sheep or a lost son. The coin represents those who have become hardened and do not recognise or don't want to recognise that they have become lost. The lighted lamp that the woman uses is the Holy Spirit who brings God's light into this darkened world to show up and reveal the things of darkness and to reveal God's truth. Some people don't know they're lost, just like the silver coin doesn't know it's lost. Some are afraid, like the lost sheep, feeling their danger and unhappiness. But the coin represents those who don't feel lost. But the Holy Spirit knows that they're lost, and so searches them out 
until they are found. Jesus says that there is rejoicing in heaven over the finding of such a lost person. Each found person brings joy to the angels. Amazing, isn't it? The angels of God care about you and me and our neighbour and even that person at work who's so difficult to deal with and to get alongside with. Turning to our reading and the parable of the lost son, some commentators have pointed out that nowhere does it state in so many words that the father in the story is meant to be God. Whilst true, it is also, however, a truth that God is the father from whom every family in heaven and on earth takes its name, Ephesians 3.15. And there is without doubt a perfect likeness between the Father in the story and our Father in heaven. And that is the unbridled joy of the Father when the lost son returns home. The son goes off on his own, determined to find his own way in life, happily taking the riches and the, ble the, riches and the blessings of the, his father with him, but still wanting to be independent and self-sufficient. He wants to throw off what he perceives to be the shackles and restrictions of living in his father's house under his rules. The son believes he can do a better job on his own by living by his rules and by his values. But of course, as we know, things didn't work out the way he'd planned. His riotous lifestyle leads to him losing all that he had and he descends into despair. The son realises that he has lost his way, recognising that even the servants at his father's house live a better life than he does now. I'm being really stupid to stay here, he thought. I'll swallow my pride and I'll go back to my father and tell him frankly that I was wrong, that I have sinned against heaven as well as him. I will tell him that I am not worthy to be called his son. He was really sorry for what he'd done. He was humble and willing to apologise for his actions and for the consequences of trying to go off on his own and do things his way. This son, unlike Adam in the Garden of Eden, didn't try to blame anyone else or pretend that life had somehow dealt him a bad hand or had treated him unfairly. He spoke the truth about himself admitting and acknowledging his sin and his wrongful ways. Not easy to do, but something that must be done if we are to come before God. The father had waited at home, but that doesn't mean he didn't care whether or not his son returned home. Our Heavenly Father has sent out his son and his spirit to seek us, the lost, to carry us home, or to light up the road for us that leads towards the narrow door that Doug recently spoke about. God himself is the home base to which all of us in the end will return. On seeing his son, the father recognises his beloved and has an immediate and all-consuming compassion on this his son who had gone off and wasted all his money and talents, who had sinned in every conceivable way, and who had returned dirty, dishevelled, starved of love and sustenance, and smelling literally like a pigsty. Suddenly, the son feels his father's loving arms embrace him. He's pulled in tight. This is no arm's length cursory peck on the cheek, but rather an intimate bear hug. He who had felt lost, unloved, uncared for, abandoned, forgotten, rejected and despised, now felt the unconditional and all-encompassing love of his father as he repents for all the wrong things that he's done. And you can almost hear, can't you? You can almost hear the singing of the angels in heaven as they witness and celebrate this scene of repentance, forgiveness and redemption. 
These three parables then tell us of the misery of people being lost and of God's joy in finding them. The Father who loves them and pities them wants to save them, us. And Luke's picture of these lost ones are summarised in St John's words. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. In these three parables, then, we see the whole story of salvation. Jesus, the shepherd, seeking the lost and carrying us safely home on his shoulders. The Spirit bringing light and life into our lives. The Father welcoming us home, the repentant sinner. The recalcitrant brother, jealous of the welcome his erstwhile wayward sibling had received whilst he'd remained at home, was yet another dig at those Pharisees who had grumbled about the welcome that Jesus was giving to the sinners. Instead of being overjoyed for the safe return of the sinners, they were instead only concerned for their own position. So in conclusion, there is great rejoicing in heaven when any sinner humbly comes to the Father and acknowledges that they have been doing their own thing, wasting their life, that they are lost but now are found, and accept the forgiveness of the Father. For when we accept Christ as our Saviour, God the Father responds by wrapping his arms about us, cleansing us, clothing us with righteousness, feeding us with spiritual food and bringing us into fellowship with him for all eternity. What a comfort and a joy that it is to know that we who have been or who are currently lost in despair, hopelessness, fear, doubt, insecurity, loneliness or rejection, who feel that we are lost to the world are not and never will be lost to the loving embrace and welcome of the Father who continually seeks out the lost in order to bring hope, joy and salvation to all.